to crime and court. My name is Heather and this is episode 28 part 2 of the citizens or the people's motion sorry for to lift the buffer zone that is being considered now by the Supreme Court. So um, as you know or may not know in part one we went over the fact that um, uh, the um, a few citizens, individuals who like to express their First Amendment right, and um, they were upset, obviously, about the buffer zone because they were regular supporters of Karen Reed standing out in front of the courthouse. Well, as it stands now, there is a 200-foot buffer zone around the courthouse. Um, Oh, yeah, here I have an image. I'm going to pop up on the screen there. So if you look at the, this is like an asinine and ridiculous, bogus (laughs) thing. Like, look how far it goes up to the, this other building back there. It's like the whole parking lot of the registry of deeds, I guess, that um, you can't even be near. So they've really given themselves a nice perimeter so that no protesters, they don't have to see protesters when they walk into their chambers, the uh, judge, Judge Canoni. So this, I apologize for the red, that is not my doing. Um, So this is the expedited review of an order of the Supreme, of single justice of the Supreme Judicial Court for Suffolk County. And this is the Commonwealth's response. Okay, so we're going to go over this and then we're going to go over the citizens reply that is now in Supreme Court's hands. So this is the issue at hand. Um, Yeah, so, okay, so the issue presented, where the trial judge's order setting a buffer zone for an imminent trial effectuated the significant government interest of a fair trial, did not burden more speech than necessary to protect the interests of a fair trial, particularly as it related to witnesses and jurors and allowed demonstrators to demonstrate 200 feet away from the courthouse complex, did the single justice abuse his discretion or otherwise err in denying the petitioner's petitions? So did she make an error by not granting their petition to override this or to to deny, basically their petition was to deny the Commonwealth's motion for a buffer zone. So she denied it. If she would have approved it, then there would be no buffer zone. So that's what they're saying there. So that is the issue that is before us. The statement of case on January 9th, 2022, the Norfolk County Grand Jury returned indictments charging Karen Reed with second degree homicide in violation of GL 2651 manslaughter while operating under the influence of liquor in violation of the same orders, whatever, and leaving the scene where someone's life ended resulted in violation of same whatever concerning the unaliving of John O'Keefe. Officer John O'Keefe. Let's put officer in front of his name. But the Commonwealth doesn't want to remind you that he's an officer because he was found in front of the lawn, uh, on the lawn of another fellow officer's home. All right, so on March, oh wait, did I miss? saw a complaint previously issued out of Stoughton District. Okay, there's nothing here that really matters. All right. Um, On March 26, 2024, the Commonwealth filed a motion for buffer zone surrounding Norfolk Superior Court and request for order prohibiting signs or clothing in favor of either party or law enforcement. On April 3rd, 2020, 2024, petitioners Tracy Ann Spacuza, Lorena Jenkinson, Dana Stewart Leonard, 
and Paul Cristoforo filed the citizens' motion to intervene for the limited purpose of upholding and defending the First Amendment by opposing the Commonwealth's motion for a buffer zone and restraining signs or clothing that express a viewpoint about the trial. On April 3rd and 4th, the American Civil Liberties Union of Massachusetts filed a motion for leave to file an amicus memorandum and its amicus memorandum. So it, yes, we read through that in part one. We read uh, the... Um, it was a different version of uh, the, it was a short, shortened version of what I had read last time in part two. We've already read on my channel, but it was um, going over the um, first, sorry, the first motion or briefing. I guess it's a brief. It's a brief for in, um, what do they call it? Common, no. The citizen's motion to intervene for the limited purpose of upholding and defending the First Amendment. So the citizen's motion to intervene with this motion that came from the Commonwealth. So that's where this all started from. And we read through that. All right. Oops. Not on the conclusion. On that. That's the reply. All right, so back to this. At a hearing on April 4th, 2024, the trial judge, that's Beverly J. Canoni, denied the citizen's motion to intervene and granted the ACLU motion for leave to file an amicus. Defendant Reed took no position on the Commonwealth's motion. So not only did she deny the motion she didn't even hear them they had a representative on their behalf a lawyer great lawyer who has been on a lot of live streams mark randaza who's very 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 passionate he knows nothing about karen reed he only knows that he is very passionate about the first amendment and that's what he was fighting for for these guys but she wouldn't even hear him talk on the that fourth april 4th all right so later that day the trial judge issued a memorandum and order stating that this is the order. It is hereby ordered that no individual may demonstrate in any manner, including carrying signs or placards within 200 feet of the courthouse complex during trial, unless otherwise ordered by the court. This complex includes the Norfolk Superior Courthouse building and the parking area behind the Norfolk County Registry of Deeds building. Like I said, or like I showed you, it's that parking lot of the registry, the registry of deeds is very large. So they're, they have a perimeter all around that. So you really are very limited as to where you can go and stand. And I know there's a church. If you look under that sign that says Norfolk Superior Court, right under that sign, there's a white building with a steeple. You can kind of see the shadow of the steeple. That is the church where they usually, they have been congregating there because that is the 200 foot buffer zone and that's the closest route to the courthouse for them so that's where they usually are standing now all right so it is ordered that no individual may demonstrate blah 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 within 200 feet of the courthouse the complex includes the norfolk superior courthouse building and the parking area around the registry of deeds Individuals are also prohibited from using audio enhancing devices while protesting. So keep your bullhorns at home, turtle boy. That means you, he does have a bullhorn. <laughs> and I think you should bring it, but you can't. It's a, that's a violation of the order. And they would throw him in jail as fast as he brought it there. All right, so it is further ordered that no individuals will be permitted to wear or exhibit any buttons photographs, clothing, or insignia relating to the case pending against the defendant or relating to any trial participant 
in the courthouse during the trial. Law enforcement officers who are testifying or are members of the audience are also prohibited from wearing their department-issued uniforms or any police emblems in the courthouse. So that is the order. On April 10th, 2024, the individuals denied intervention in Norfolk Superior Court filed a petition under GL 2113 and an emergency motion to stay. So they took it to Superior Court. On the same day, an unincorporated organization and individual persons also filed a substantially similar petition under GL 2113. Um, both petitions were filed by the same council. Oh, okay. Uh, What was this one I missed? On April 9th, the individuals who moved to intervene filed a petition in appeals court. On April 10th, a single justice, Peter W. Sachs, concluded that he had no authority to act. Oh, okay. So this did go to an appeals court. And the, that's where, this is the single justice they're trying to overturn, I think. And, I mean... Canoni too, because she's a single justice, but I don't know if that counts. <laughs> All right, so where were we? The Commonwealth filed a consolidated response. The petitioners filed a consolidated reply. And on April 12, 2024, a single justice of the Supreme Judicial Court for Suffolk County denied the petitions, finding that the denial of the motion to intervene was not appropriate for review under GL 211. However, there was standing to challenge the buffer zone order, and that buffer zone order was a reasonable restriction of time, place, and manner, as it was content neutral, burdened no more speech than necessary to serve a significant government interest, and left ample alternative channels of communication. The same day, the petitioners filed a consolidated notice of appeal. On April 16th, the petitioners filed a memorandum and appendix pursuant to Supreme Judicial Court Rule 221. On April 19th, this court allowed the appeal to proceed on an expedited basis. So, that's where we're at. Jury selection in Norfolk Superior Court trial commenced on April 16th and is ongoing. So the trial is ongoing. The, uh, well, I guess maybe at at the time this was written, they were still in jury selection. All right, so the statement of facts. Statement of facts is premised on the affidavit of the lead prosecutor who argued the motion that was filed before the judge. Okay, so the lead prosecutor, who we know is Adam Lolly, and we know he's not trustworthy. (laughs) So this is his statement of facts. At the April 4th, 2024 hearing on its motion for a buffer zone, the Commonwealth proffered the following. Its proposed buffer zone had been used in other criminal trials in the courthouse. The proposals were neutral, regardless of viewpoint content of signage or clothing. But it's not neutral if only one side is out there putting their message forth. So you've effectively shut down one side when it's only one side that's doing it. So it's not, you can say it's content neutral because we said even the other side can't protest. Well, they're not out there protesting, so you're not blocking them from doing so. So it's not neutral. The Commonwealth's motion was about the juror's duty to perform their civic duty free from the extraneous influences and that a fair and impartial jury was needed. So if they can't be impartial based on a couple of protesters outside, then they shouldn't be on the jury. And that should have been dealt with in the voir dire process. The Commonwealth noted that the judge would inquire about extraneous influences and raised to the court the potential impossibility of the jury being able to answer in the negative if they were bombarded each time they walked in or out of the courtroom. 
the Commonwealth anal analogized, analogized, sorry, <laughs> analogized its request for a buffer zone to time and place restrictions in voting cases. The Commonwealth, but this is totally different, and the people, the public, the courthouse is a public place. The courthouse steps are a public place and there is no more of a patriotic place to be than on the, the courthouse steps representing your freedom of speech and protecting that right. So I'm sorry, you can say whatever, but being on the courthouse steps is a, a more significant, important message that's being given and by doing this they're dispersing everybody and making it harder for people to congregate in front of the courthouse which that's what they want so commonwealth noted that there were instances in the last year where jurors and other cases had to receive instructions from the court due to the impact from the activities related to pretrial hearings in this matter well yes okay so that's exactly what you do you have the judge give them some instruction to say you are not to base your opinion on any signage or protesters or supporters or whatever, you know, however she words it. That's fine. But don't block our people from being on the steps. You know, give give the instruction and let us stand at the door. Let the jurors come in the back door if that's really what you're so concerned about. The trial judge stated that rather than handle the motion for a buffer zone administratively, she had scheduled it for a hearing to give the defendant an opportunity to be heard. The defendant took no position. The trial judge, so this is Beverly Canoni, this is this happened on the record. We I remember watching this trial or hearing, I should say. The trial judge found that nothing in the Massachusetts rules of criminal procedure supported intervention by private citizens in criminal cases, but stated that she read the motion to intervene. <sighs> okay. The trial judge indicated that she also reviewed the ACLU amicus and found it very helpful. Well, did you read it? I mean, she said she read it, but... And that it was helpful. So if it was helpful, what did it help you decide? because the amicus was fully in support of denying the Commonwealth's motion for the buffer zone. So I don't know what she read, but she didn't read it properly. The trial judge orally found that an external buffer zone was appropriate, prudent regulation on in-court expression was needed, a 500-foot buffer zone was far too excessive, and that her obligation was to reasonably accommodate the rights of all people to protest in a meaningful way while ensuring that the case be decided fairly based on the evidence without any undue interference from outside pressures or influence in accordance with the law. In her written order, the trial judge noted that to ensure the defendant's right to a fair trial, the court could restrict protected speech so long as the restrictions do not burden substantially more speech than is necessary to further the government's legitimate interests. The trial judge then found, in this case, it is well documented that protesters have shouted at witnesses and confronted family members of the victim. That is not true. Not true. They were not doing that. If anybody was doing that, it was people on the other side. Because, if anything, they might shout, Karen, free Karen Reed, but... They're not shouting like, boo, you suck. We hate you. You're guilty. They are not shouting these things at people. They're not like trying to intimidate or yell at witnesses and family members and whatnot. But that's what she's making it seem like. It's well documented that protesters have shouted at witnesses and confronted family members of the victim. Um, family members of the victim have actually confronted people in the crowd in aggressive manners. So maybe, maybe she should do a little research on what's going on, actually. 
Individuals have also taken to displaying materials which may or may not be introduced into evidence during trial. Bitch, so what? And airing their opinions as to the guilt or innocence of the defendant on their clothing or on signage. And that's perfectly within their rights to do on the courthouse steps. Witness intimidation has also been a prevalent issue in this case. It has not, but you can see now Judge Canoni is fully on board that Turtle Boy would, you know, if he came in her courtroom, she would have him find him guilty too. <laughs> this is just ridiculous. Given these, okay, and he, let's also, also be clear that Aiden Carney, Turtle Boy, has been charged with witness intimidation. He has not been convicted of witness intimidation because the charges are never, ever, ever in a million years going to stick. They are fighting these. He had every right as a journalist and as an American to be asking questions of the citizen of the of the, the witnesses in this case. And that's that's why he went to jail. Or at least that's why he's getting the witness intimidation charges, because he asked questions. Questions that the, the witnesses didn't want to answer, apparently. So given these past actions, the court concludes there is a substantial risk that the defendant's right to a fair trial will be jeopardized if prospective jurors are exposed to the protests and messages displayed on signs or otherwise particularly before this court has had an opportunity to instruct the jurors about their obligations with regard to remaining fair and unbiased. Okay, great. They are now seated. We're on day two as I as I record this. We are on day two of the Karen Reen trial and the jury's already seated. So why are we not lifting the buffer zone now? There's no reason for it anymore. You wanted it during jury selection, so you weren't prejudicing the juries. I get that. But now, there's no reason for the 200-foot buffer zone. No reason. This makes me angry. <laughs> if you can't tell, like, I get passionate talking about this. All right, so the risk extends during trial where jurors and witnesses would have no choice but to be exposed daily to the messages and viewpoints of the protesters when entering and leaving the courthouse or sitting in the courtroom. Not sitting in the courtroom because you can ban it from your courtroom. You can't ban it from outside. The defendant here is entitled to a fair trial. They all, yeah, you're doing this all for Karen with an impartial jury free from outside influence focused solely on the evidence presented in the courtroom during trial and the applica applicable law. The pro to protect this right, this court must reduce the risk of exposing witnesses or jurors to, in this case, in, to such outside influences. Let's actually reword this to be truthful and say the Commonwealth doesn't want all those supporters of the defendant to be prejudicing the prejudicing I can never say that word the jury and making them believe that she's innocent and now we're handicapped in our trial we because people have spoken out we can't ever get a fair shot us the commonwealth that's really what they're saying here And that's all I'm going to read from there. So good. All right. So we are going to move on now to the petitioner's reply brief. So this was filed just recently um, to the Supreme Court. Let me make it a little bigger. From Mark Randaza and Mark Trammell. Two Marks. One with a C, one with a K. Ooh, that's hard to... <laughs> that's a... Uh, argument waiting to happen. <laughs> Mark with a C or with a K. All right, so here we have. Is that just, yeah, we just start off with argument. Okay, so argument. The government fails to refute the fact that a superior court judge does not have authority outside the courthouse over non participants. So, if, in case I didn't mention, this is the 
petitioner's reply to the Supreme Court. So they originally appealed it, blah, blah, blah. It got the one judge said, you can't, I don't have a throw to you or whatever. So now they're appealing it to a higher court and they want, they asked for expedited information. So this is the expedited information that they have put together to argue their case further in order to get this buffer zone lifted. And that um, what we just read was the Commonwealth, obviously. That was their reply to it. All right, so here we go. Applicants establish that a trial judge has no power to enact a zone outside of the courthouse where speech is prohibited. The government fails to come up with any authority supporting their position, instead providing a number of cases that either explicitly or imp- implied impliedly support the appellate's position. So any, we didn't read through all the argument because I think some of the argument can be boring with, you know, um, like quoting other cases and whatnot. Um, But I guess all the other cases that they've been citing in the Commonwealth in their filing are really supporting the petitioners, if you actually look at it. For example, the government cites a case to support the proposition that a judge can transfer venue, Crocker versus justices of superior court. Of course they do. It is hardly controversial to suggest a court has authority to manage the cases on its own docket. If the judge in this case had done that, there would be no dispute. The government then provides cases that demonstrate that judges have power to control judicial system personnel, conduct of participants in a trial, actions of officers of the court, and the internal court environment. But none of that means, by extension, that the superior court has the authority or jurisdiction to tell ordinary citizens who are neither trial participants, officers of the court, nor judicial systems personnel, what they can or cannot do even one foot outside of the courthouse curtilage, much less 200 feet from it, even inside private businesses or on or within private property. So like, let's look at it again. There is obviously going to be other people's property in this 200 buffer zone. So how do you remedy that? What if I live right across the courthouse and I want to put my free Karen Reed sign in my lawn? I'm breaking a law. This is so stupid. All right. So um, even inside private businesses or on or within private property. So private property and businesses alike are both in this 200 buffer zone. A perusal, yes, okay. A perusal of a map of the area shows that this prior restraint zone even overlaps the Dedham Public Library. I don't know which building that is. You guys might know better than me. I don't know. Uh, Maybe it's that big building with a black roof behind the Registry of Deeds. I don't know. Or maybe it's across the street from one of the courthouses. I don't know. Uh, Not my area. You guys would, uh, from Massachusetts, would know much better than me. All right, so a perusal of a map area shows that this prior restraint zone even overlaps the Denham Public Library. A public library is perhaps the the most First Amendment protective environment we should have. Yet, this untailored prior restraint zone was not even customized to exclude the library. So the library technically can't even have signage if it could be misconstrued some way or another to be in support of John or uh, Karen or um, the Commonwealth, either or. Yeah, this is crazy. The library is in the zone. All right, so the government invokes GL 
220, uh, whatever. I don't know how to say these things. You know what I mean. (laughs) The government invokes this statute for what seems to be the proposition that a trial court has unlimited power to do anything it sees fit without any limitation, as long as it deems it necessary for the performance of their duties. But the cases cited after that show Oh, but the cases cited after that show that there is this is not so broad. In Commonwealth versus Hardy, the court limited the attendees inside the courtroom, not outside the courthouse. There has never been a case where a court issued such an order and it was upheld after a challenge and not a single case citing was used to declare a superior court judge to have the power to create any kind of territorial control. Further, even if this court now finds for the first time in the Commonwealth's history that this statute confers such power and trial that the trial court must that the trial court still must exercise that power consistent with the First Amendment, which it has not done. All right. So the government then cites Commonwealth versus Gomes, which does not support their legal position, but clearly relays to us what the Superior Court should have done here. Here, the judge instructed the jury prior to the view that anything they may see or hear outside the courtroom is not evidence and that they were not, they were to decide the case solely on the evidence presented in the courtroom. Bam, there's your remedy. All bedge, all bedge, <laughs> Judge Bev is what I was trying to say. All Judge Bev needs to do is say that. And lo and behold, our protesters or supporters, really, they're peaceful. They can step, you know, closer now to the courthouse doors. You guys don't even let them on the steps because no one on the steps. Anyways, all right, so Commonwealth versus Gomes, precisely that is what Judge Canoni should have done instead of usurping legislative power and throwing a blanket over a huge section of a town running roughshod over the First Amendment, all to stifle criticism of the government. I have never heard that word before, roughshod? Let's take a look. I am so overwhelmed. There are so many. (laughs) Roughshod. Having shoes with... No, that can't be it. Protect... Projecting to prevent slipping? Meaning. Oh, wow, that was loud in my ear. Sorry. That was so loud. So it's pronounced roughshod. But it says, of a horse having shoes with nail heads projecting to prevent slipping. So is there a modern? Caked shoes. How to use roughshod in a sentence. Marked, oh, the second meaning. Thank you, Miriam Webster, for giving me another meaning. It means marked by tyrannical force. So, basically, he just called Judge Canoni a tyrant. I love learning new words. Roughshod. Marked by tyrannical force. She was running roughshod over the First Amendment, all to stifle criticism of the government. I love his writing. All right, so number two footnote. As noted in the opening brief, a significant amount of criticism has been aimed at Judge Canoni herself. That criticism has become heightened since the imposition of the prior restraint zone. Accordingly, while there is no accusation here that she acted improperly out of self-interest, the appearance of a lack of neutrality is damaging to the legitimacy of any decision by a judge that stifles criticism of that very judge. Interesting. It would not it would be 
not only proper, but preferable if there is a remand that it be assigned to a special master of some type. So that's interesting. Roughshod all over the First Amendment. I love that. Running roughshod. All right. Number two, the findings were no such thing. (laughs) So they weren't findings at all. So the findings weren't findings. A finding of fact is not simply a pronouncement by a judge that a fact is what she loosely says it is. To find a fact is not to find the judge's opinion on rumors or matters she has not even seen herself in the record. Like making the blanket statement that people have been harassed or that witnesses have been yelled at or whatever she said. I can't remember the words. Um, What's her proof? She's not even there. She's in the courtroom all day. To find a fact is not to find the judge's opinion on rumors or matters that she has not seen herself in the record. A request that the evidence warrants a certain finding of fact means that the evidence, if believed, permits such a finding. Instead, it is the judge's declaration of facts reached after deliberation and deduction on an essential material or relevant fact that has been put in issue. That's a quote. So it's the judge's declaration of facts reached after deliberation and deduction on an essential material or relevant fact that has been put in issue. Or maybe that's a quote from Commonwealth versus Isaiah. I don't know. And which reflect a weighing of the evidence rather than a mere citation of the evidence. Yeah, so that's coming from there. Sorry, that's not a quote from Judge Bev. All right. Um, The government uh, argues that since it charged Aidan Carney with witness intimidation, which charges are contested and of which he is presumed innocent, that you remember judge Canoni, that presumption of innocence the thing that you don't let karen have that all right so in and carney the with witness intimidation which charges are contested and of which he is presumed innocent such establishes a fact that there has been witness intimidation so just because he's been charged with it doesn't mean that there is witness intimidation and you should know this because you're a judge so As the Commonwealth and the Superior Court well know, an arrest or an indictment is not evidence to be considered in determining whether a person is guilty or not guilty. The appellants accuse the Commonwealth of abuse of power. The Commonwealth's opinion is due no more weight than the undersigns. In the interest of full disclosure, Randazza Legal Group represents Carney, on an unrelated defamation matter. So there you go. Under the Commonwealth's logic, appellants, I have no idea how to say that, and I'm going to look it up because you know we like to learn on this channel. I like to learn. I don't know if you like to learn, but I like to learn. That's why I'm here. All right, so what does it say? Oh, here we go. Ipse Dixit. I have no idea if that's how you say it. Basically, it means, it's a Latin term, obviously, that translates to he himself said it. In legal context, it refers to an assertion or statement made by an individual based solely on their own authority without any supporting evidence of proof. And that's a good way to describe it because that's exactly what she did i want to see if i can find an uh there's oh there it is here ipsy dixit ipsy dixit ipsy dixit is what google told me is how you say it so under the commonwealth's logic appellants ipsy dixit establishes that this fact as common as much as the commonwealth has established that fact with respect to mr carney so you can't just say because it's so and i'm a judge it is all right so however let us accept 
that since the government accused a journalist of intimidation because they did not like his reporting, that is now a fact. Your, <laughs> because he was charged with this bogus witness intimidation thing, you're just saying by here and large, they, there's witness intimidation going on in this case for sure. And there is, but not on our side. It's not on the Karen Reed side, the free Karen Reed side. Why should this order apply to anyone other than Mr. Carney? Footnote here. The appellants do not urge this relief, but at least it would have been precise narrow tailoring if Mr. Carney were accused of unaliving, Tracy Spacuza could not would not be the one subject to pretrial confinement. All right, so why? Okay, I read that. If this is the sum of their findings, the government has done nothing to support the creation of the prior restraint zone. It set a dangerous precedent, that's for sure. All the government need to do prevent criticism is to charge one person and use those charges to enjoin everyone else. Which is what they've done, especially with Canton 9. Moreover, the Superior Court made no findings that someone holding up a Black Lives Matter banner would impact the trial. The Superior Court made no finding that a sign that says 2 Corinthians 3.17 would threaten the Commonwealth's ability to prosecute this case. The Superior Court made no finding that other alternative means of addressing the interests raised would not be just as effective. The Superior Court made no finding that jury instructions like in Gomes would be ineffective. So she didn't think of other remedies. Obviously, she just went straight for it and was like, fine, which is why I think maybe she was like in cahoots with Michael Morrissey. And you know what? Who was it? I think somebody called in on the Glare show. I think it was the Glare where I heard it. Someone called in and said that Bev and Morrissey went to school together and they're friends. Plus she used to be, um, she used to be a defense attorney, I, I think. And, um, she knew, I mean, she knew Morrissey. She worked alongside him a lot. So and there's that. And Morrissey is the one that requested the buffer zone. All right, so the findings are not findings at all. There is not even a scrap of admissible documentary or testimonial evidence in the record supporting them. This is unsurprising because the hearing was held in a perfunctory manner, excluding the real parties of interest and expressly precluding them from having an opportunity to be heard this is the precise opposite of making findings and how things are supposed to be done. All right, so here's the footnote. That the Superior Court entertained an amicus brief is no substitute from hearing from those who would actually be restrained. Moreover, amici have no, I don't know if I'm saying that right, have no right to initiate, extend, or enlarge issues, nor to appeal or dismiss issues. So, like, why did that have more weight than even, like, hearing the people themselves saying, Judge, you're infringing on my rights? I don't know. Because she doesn't care, but that's besides the point. All right, so number 3.0. Oh, the government plays loose with definitions of content and prior restraint. So the government plays the part of the Cheshire Cat with terms like content-based and prior restraint. It expects this court to accept it means that the government says it means, my dear. But that does not make it so. The government argues that this is not a content-based restriction, but it is without a doubt. The Commonwealth could be forgiven for claiming that it is not viewpoint based, even though it is viewpoint motivated. But content? Even at this very moment, commercial speech is taking place inside the prior restraint zone. So they're showing you here there is signage 
all around, like township signage and <laughs> people with, you know, uh, news vans with logos and things like that. There is tons of signage. See photograph posted by ex-user Grant Smith Ellis outside Denham Courthouse on first day of read trial showing commercial signage within prior restraint zone. Number six, you can also find it at that link. If that content is allowed by justice on a sign is not, or wait, sorry, let me reread that. If that content is allowed, but the word justice on a sign is not, then where is the support for the argument that the order is not content-based? Dashed on the rocks like the Hesperus, Hesperus, that is where it, what? Why are there so many terms I have never heard? (laughs) Words I've never heard. What is this? Hesper... S- oh, the Hespersus is a mountain, I think. I think it's a mountain range. I have no idea. Okay. Yeah, dashed on the rocks like the Hespersus, that is where it is. Um, I'm assuming, I don't know if I'm saying it right, and there is no way to, there's no thing to play to whatever it is. I think it's a mountain range, so that makes sense in the context. Might be local, probably. All right. Um, anyways. Uh, All right. So the Commonwealth simply wishes to change the definition of prior restraint so that it can claim that this is not one. However, the interest that the government purports to seemingly advance here is protecting jurors and witnesses from intimidation. This is an important interest. It is so important that the legislature passed uh, GL 26813A and B, any violation of those statutes is to be dealt with after it occurs. And this court has already indicated that statutes that restrain speech that intend to and do cause intimidation are constitutionally circumscribed to only restraining unprotected fighting words and true threats. Here, the government seeks to simply declare that all speech, not merely fighting words or true threats inside the prior restraint zone, is effectively violating 13A or 13B unless it is a commercial speech, in which case it is allowed. The order restrains constitutionally protected speech before it is uttered. It is an unconstitutional prior restraint beautifully worded. All right, so 4.0. The government's cases do not support its position. So the government points to security measures for the 2004 Democratic Convention to justify the prior restraint zone, citing black tea, whatever that is, versus city of Boston. First, those restrictions were imposed by a municipality with authority over the affected areas, not a judge acting ultra... Oh my god, there's so many terms. I should just keep my phone out. What is this? Ultra? Yeah, what is that? Ultravires. Ultravires. Acting or done beyond one's legal power or authority. My god, this guy knows a lot of really cool terms. (laughs) Beyond one's legal power or authority. He will take action against any body acting ultra... How do you say it again? Ultra-vires. 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 All right, so back to the sentence. First, those restrictions were imposed by a municipality with authority over the affected areas, not a judge acting ultra-vires. So out of her out of her zone. She's acting beyond her authority. Further, 
Even a perfunctory review of that case shows a highly developed record full of concerns about terrorism and Judge Selya invoking the smoldering ruins of the World Trade Center to justify the establishment of access perimeters around the convention. But most importantly, those restrictions were about who could enter the perimeter, not what they could say once inside the perimeter. So that was different. That's not a restriction on their speech. It was a restriction on who may enter that space. The city established a highly secure hard zone in the area immediately surrounding the Fleet Center, a zone for which the United States Secret Service presumed principal responsibility, and a less secure soft zone extending several blocks south in the, in the area commonly known as Bullfinch Triangle. Only candidates, delegates, staff, press, and other specially authorized classes of persons were permitted into the hard zone. Can you stop shaking the bed? She's... She, hmm. I don't know if you guys can tell. My dog's shaking the bed. It's really driving me nuts. It's probably, like, making my scream. Can you stop? Hazel, enough. She just keeps scratching the same spot over and over again. All right, so only delicates staff, all those people were authorized in the zone, and even they had to pass through mag magnetometers before entering. By contrast, ped pedestrian access to and through the soft zone was generally unrestricted, although vehicles were not allowed to enter. This dual arrangement left little opportunity for groups wishing to demonstrate to do so within sight and sound of the delegates, especially since chartered buses, which loaded and unloaded within the hard zone, ferried the delegates to and from the fleet center. So you could, you could um, bus in all of your jurors from somewhere and take them to the back door and then they don't have to see any of the picketers. Accordingly, comparing the Dedham prior restraint zone to the Democratic National Convention Zone is nonsensical. The Democratic Party got a permit months in advance and cordoned off an area with municipal, municipal authority and through the permitting process for a private event, the Black Tea Party or the Black Tea Society, whatever that, that is. All right. So essentially, the Black Tea Society essentially wanted access to areas that had been leased to a private entity so they could protest. They had no more right to enter the cordoned off areas than protesters would have to enter the Topsfield Fair without a ticket. So that makes sense. Like you need to pay to enter this private event. Neither does Frisbee versus Schultz give the government's position any comfort. Frisbee was a case about a statute, not a judicial decree, and it banned picketing a private residence. General marching through residential neighborhoods or even walking around in front of the, an entire block of houses is not prohibited by this ordinance. Accordingly, we construe the ban to be a limited one, only focused picketing taking place solely in front of a particular residence is prohibited. So you can't just do it solely in front of one residence, which makes no sense. But you can go to multiple residences is what that tells me. And so what Turtle Boy did was not illegal because they drove their cars and then got out and did some protests on residential blocks. And apparently that's witness intimidation, according to Massachusetts. All right, so the prior restraint zone, on the other hand, is an area where all free speech is simply vaporized upon breaking the perimeter. The statute in Frisbee tolerated demonstrations. It just did not tolerate congregating in front of a particular residence. In this circumstance, had the Superior Court simply entered an order that nobody could block the entrance to the courthouse, that would have been consistent with Frisbee. So that's all they needed to do. Don't block the courthouse entrance and I will give the jurors an instruction that nothing outside of this courtroom is evidence. Perfect. You just dealt with it. Beautiful. And now people don't have their right taken away. We do not need an order that bans all demonstrations. Exactly. 
The trial judge made no findings, claiming that the trial judge was somehow uniquely tuned in to what was the right thing to do misses the point. The trial judge made no findings, relied on no evidence, and refused to even hear from the affected public, the citizens that filed the petition to stay. In addition, or in fact, the order at least has the appearance of having been crafted to stifle criticism of the judge. Given this, in the matter, if the matter is remanded for actual factual findings, which are a prerequisite to establishment of any prior restraint zone, no matter how small, then the judicial officer entrusted to create the zone should be specially appointed rather than remanding the matter to the judge who erred in the first place. So Judge Canoni shouldn't be the one deciding on this. Reliance on Lyons versus Secretary of the Commonwealth is of no comfort either. So that's another case that the Commonwealth cited here. Again, that was a statute passing by the representatives of the citizens of the Commonwealth, not simply decreed by one person who made no findings and who cannot be thrown out of office at the next election if the citizens find that her actions were tyrannical. <laughs> Additionally, there are no alternate means to provide for a peaceful voting experience. Voters came to the polls or did before COVID. In the circumstance of a trial, jurors can come in through the back door to the courthouse or can be delivered to the courthouse in vehicles where they do not need to even see anything else. Further, there is no impediment to the police enforcing these laws which, or statutes which occupy the legal turf that the Massachusetts legislature has chosen to occupy on this subject. It boggles the mind to understand how the Commonwealth makes the following argument. They say, this is not a case such as United States versus Grace, where a blanket prohibition on parading, assembling, or displaying banners, devices, or signage on public sidewalks around the Supreme Court was found unconstitutional. How is it not? It is exactly like that. <laughs> the Commonwealth's brief at 27. The only difference between this case and Grace is that in Grace, at least the zone was created by Congress, but the Supreme Court on the United States itself was willing to uphold the First Amendment and protect the right of the people to picket and demonstrate off-court property. Finally, the Commonwealth seeks to simply hard wave the fact that the issuance of the order was infected from the start with a lack of due process, as if Carol versus President and whatever Princess Anne. President and the commissioners of Princess Anne. Who's Princess Anne? I might want to look that up. All right, so <laughs> Carol versus the President and commissioners of Princess Anne does not apply. As the Commonwealth admits, there a, a court issued an ex parte restraining order against certain persons. Here, the Superior Court issued an ex parte order that certain persons, i.e. everyone, cannot act as full-fledged citizens because the government does not like seeing signs that criticize them. That is the purpose and the function of the order and it must be struck down. Conclusion, the order created a prior restraint zone without due process, without allowing affected parties to be heard, and without proper findings to justify it. Even if all of that were not true, the prior restraint zone violates the First Amendment because it is not narrowly tailored, nor is it a better way than much more less impactful ways of addressing the claimed concerns. Yes, because he just went through so many other options that they could have done. The order must be struck down, and if there is a remand for further consideration of the Commonwealth's motion with due process and proper consideration of the First Amendment, the remand as to the motion should be a special master and not the judge that originally imposed the order. So if you send this back to the lower courts, don't give me Judge Bev Canoni to, to decide this. Somebody else, impartial, needs to look at this and say, 
something, you know, give give an order instead of, you know, the same exact unbiased person who just completely vacated due process and all the other things regarding not just the citizens, but the First Amendment as well. It's crazy. Crazy that the Commonwealth just seems to keep getting away with more and more. I just feel like they are so brazenly corrupt. Something's got to happen. I mean, I really, really firmly believe there is, um, well, there is karma for one, but that's not what I was going to say. I just came up with my mind. I really believe that the feds are giving the Commonwealth the rope to hang themselves and they're letting Judge Bev do what she's going to do. And if she shows her cards to be on the Commonwealth side, well, then that's a problem. So I really think that it, it could be a problem for Judge Bev and it's a problem for Adam Lolly and any other prosecutor that is on this case and any law enforcement official that had anything to do with anything with this case because they're just so corrupt they're so corrupt i mean not that there's officials in the case about the the buffer zone but when it comes to the investigation of karen reed and the unaliving of John O'Keefe, there's a major issue and it's evident and you're seeing it now. You're seeing how biased, like it just, they, uh, somewhere along the lines kind of implied just the fact that the judge allowed the, this buffer zone kind of proves that she's biased because she's siding with them. And she doesn't want the message against the government out there. It's just, it's so sickening, the abuse of power. I mean, it is such an abuse of power that is going on there. If you guys aren't paying attention, it could be in any town USA. That's what's so scary about this. This could be, I mean, I, I relate to Canton because we have winters that get crappy too and, you know, bad weather. And I relate to the people in Canton. I feel like they're just warm, friendly, nice people. I feel like Chicago is sort of like that, except most of us just want to like stay in our homes and we don't talk to people. But if we had an occasion to get together, we're friendly too. <laughs> so I feel like that's kind of how Canton is. Like you feel like Chicago is has some similarities to Canton. I'm not sure, but I don't know. I feel like, um, like they're kin, I guess. I feel relatable. I feel like they're much, they're very relatable, especially, you know, when I, um, know how our temperatures are. Cause I've been, you know, I've been streaming or watching these standouts and these protests for so long and I'm seeing them go in like freezing below weather. And, you know, I, I feel that because we have that here. So, I mean, I know, the suffering that these guys are doing just to stand out and uh, support their First Amendment rights and support justice for a woman who has been framed. And that's why we're here is because of Karen Reed and how the government has framed her and it's, it's coming out in testimony so far. I really haven't seen anything that's making Karen look bad. Most of it is pretty positive on the for the defense so um i mean we're only in day two when day two was half a day but still that is i feel like we're still standing in a good place and i feel like the opening statements were by by far in a way david unetti knocked it out of the park whereas lolly barely got a bunt <laughs> so little baseball reference for you guys to end my stream. I will let you guys go think about this in your own towns, how 
do you know who your prosecutor is? I don't, I don't know. I don't, you know, you gotta, well, Cook County is like ginormous. So there's like a bajillion Cook counties. But regardless, do you know who your lead prosecutor would be in your town? Do you know how your law enforcement runs? Do you, do you trust them? These are all things that we should be thinking about on a daily basis and making sure that, you know, the right people are in the position of power, not people like Judge Canoni that'll just be like, oh yeah, Michael Morrissey wants this buffer zone, which is totally unconstitutional. He says 500, I'll give him two. <laughs> what? <laughs> it's, there's so much like nepotism and you scratch my back, I'll scratch your back in this story and it's sickening and it could be anywhere like I said so anyways thank you so much for sticking around with me thank you for going around this ride of the Karen Reed trial and I will see you in the next one take care guys thanks for watching bye now if you've been impacted by a true crime and would like your story told in your own words, or if you or someone you know has been wrongfully convicted or accused of a crime, please write to crimeincourtchannel at gmail.com and tell us your real true crime encounters. Thanks for watching.